Good evening, Facebook viewers, and welcome to our TIFF Talk Summer Series. My name is Karen Gerth, and I'm a Market Development Manager at Endogastric Solutions. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Nahir Shah here to discuss TIFF, GERD, and answer all of your questions. Thank you for being here. We also Thanks. have my colleague, Wendy Prophet. Wendy will be monitoring our questions tonight. So viewers, please post your questions for Dr. Shaw and uh, Wendy will get those asked. Um, I wanna introduce Dr. Shaw. He is a board uh, certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology and obesity medicine. He practices at First Physicians Group at Sarasota Memorial Hospital in Florida, where he is uh, dedicated to endoscopy a treatment of acid reflux utilizing multiple advanced therapeutic interventions. Dr. Shaw's published uh, in local, national, international, in addition to serving on the editorial board of many journals. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, and thank you for having me. All right, so Dr. Shaw, let's um, you know kick off our program. Uh, we're going to have start off with a uh, a new short segment that we're going to call true or false and uh, how it works is I'm going to give you a statement and then let us know whether that statement is true or false. Yeah, sure. All right, Dr. Shaw, um, so I have some questions for true or false. Uh, first question, my GERD can be cured by taking PPIs. True or false? So I would say that false because, you know, acid reflux is like, you know, if you see the Montreal definition of the acid reflux, so whenever anything in your stomach comes into the esophagus, you know, that causes the reflux. Now, when we are taking PPI, we are reducing the stomach acid, but the reflux is still there. It's just not that acidic. So, you know, the PPI does extend, like, you know, does help to some extent, like, you know, uh, for the symptoms, but it generally does not cure the reflux completely. Thank you. And I know we'll get more into, uh, you know, GERD and treatment options, uh, including, you know, PPI uh, use later in the program. So yeah. our next uh, question is, uh, Barrett's esophagus, if left untreated, can lead to cancer. True or false? That's true. And then why, why would you say it's true? Or why is it true? So, to say. Right. So, so basically, we have a lot of acid inside the stomach. And because of that, the lining, you know, what we call it a mucosa of the stomach, uh, it's like a columnar epithelium. So it is more like a, so I would just, you know, to make the patient understand, you know, the skin of the stomach is much more thicker as compared to the internal skin means the mucosa of the esophagus. And that is because that the stomach mucosa has to withstand the acid. And because we have the lower esophageal sphincter at the end of the esophagus, it prevents the acid coming up into the esophagus. Now, whenever there is a long-standing history where, you know, the muscle is weak and the lower esophageal sphincter is weak and you get acid reflux into the esophagus, it erodes the mucosa of the esophagus. And because of that, the mucosa of the esophagus, which is much more delicate, it is replaced by, you know, much more resistant mucosa of the stomach. This we call it a metaplesia, it means that it, it, this is a change, this is a change, it increases the risk of cancer and even after that you know the acid reflux continues then that metaplasia turns into dysplasia and the dysplasia turns into cancer so yeah it is a long process there is and you know if acid reflux is left untreated that can or that may cause acid reflux sorry that may may cause esophageal cancer in the long run thank you for, thank you for that and then our last question is Sleep disruption can attribute to GERD. Sure. Yes, true. It's true. Um, can you, um, I guess, let our viewers know um, sleep disruption along with, I would say, probably some other types of, um, of symptoms that they might have 
up could be GERD. Right. So, you know, GERD is more like, you know, uh, I would say it's a spectrum disorder. So, I mean, you know, it's it not only they feel like they have acid coming up and, you know, burning the esophagus, that's the most common, you know, symptom of the acid reflux. But a lot of people would have, you know, a lot of, lot more other symptoms too. A lot of them, like, you know, if they have a meal later at night when they lay down, a lot of acid comes up into the esophagus and that bothers the esophagus. Many of the time it causes, like, you know, hyper reactivity in the esophagus and because of that it causes the spasm. So some people feel like they have chest pain. Sometimes, you know, uh, it comes all the way into the back of the throat and because of that they would have like a constant coughing they feel like all they always have to keep on coughing to you know clear the back of the throat a lot of people feel like they have allergies all the times uh, so some people feel like they have post nasal drip they have sinusitis they have coughing some people just think that you know it's just uh, their allergies but you know if you ask them you know that those allergies are like all the year around and it doesn't respond to the medication if that happens then it is likely due to the acid reflux and the allergies sometimes you know a lot of patient has like acid coming up in the back of the mouth and which erodes the enamel of the tooth and because of that they get cavities so that's another thing so it's not only the acid reflux it can cause like you know the i would say post nasal drip um you know uh, and the laryngopharyngeal reflux and a lot of upper symptoms too thank you for explaining that so uh, especially with the um the cavities and erosion that can be caused, you know, from the reflux. I think a lot of people don't um, recognize those atypical symptoms that you just described that they right. might be experiencing. That we typically see no. in some people who have acid reflux for like many years. If they have acid reflux for many years, like they get like a down regulation of the esophageal receptors. And because of that, they might not feel the receptors. Like if they might not feel the pain or the burning like down here in the esophagus. But then when it goes all the way back to the throat, it causes like, you know, the irritation of the throat and the coughing and all those kind of problems. So, uh, so, so when people come and see you uh, at your office and you're mm -hmm. talking to them about the occasional acid reflux versus their chronic acid reflux. Um, when when should they be concerned and when should they seek treatment? Right. So, you know, if somebody has acid reflux, you know, which happens like, you know, less than once a month or less than once a week, and that generally happens after eating like, you know, tomatoes or like, you know, really spicy food or really Italian or like, you know, uh, like a fatty food. And it is happening once uh, once in a blue moon or maybe once in a week or something like that, then, you know, I would say that, you know, that's considered, you know, not that bad. So I would not be worried that much for those people who are having occasional symptoms versus somebody who's telling me that, you know, um, I have constant acid reflux, like, you know, I always feel like, you know, I cannot eat certain kind of food. I have to make sure that I don't eat like tomatoes. I, I, I have to avoid coffee. I have to avoid tea. Like, you know, those are the people who would need, like, you know, the treatment at a younger age, or at least, you know, we need to figure it out what's happening. Um, and like, you know, sometimes like there are some of the people who would have like a minimal symptoms, but, you know, if they have obesity, if they are smokers um, and if they have other risk factors and if they are more than age of 50, then at least at least they should get an index endoscopy just to make sure that they don't have bad at the esophagus. So speaking of um, and agnostic testing, could you um, kind of talk to the audience about uh, the options available for treating GERD and maybe some of the diagnostic tests that are needed for treatments. Right. So if, so if anyone has like a long-standing acid reflux, it's getting worse, it's not under control, then, you know, I would at least say that that, you know, we should at least do the endoscopy to find out that what we are dealing with. 
uh, we really need to see the like you know the lower esophageal like you know the lower part of the esophagus and the upper part of the stomach because that's where the lower esophageal sphincter is and if they have like a weakness in the diaphragm which we call it a hiatal hernia you know we should be able to see that at the same time and, uh, we and and you know on the endoscopy we can also see if they have like severe esophagitis you know that's a sign of like you know under controlled uh, um, like you know acid reflux or we need to check and see if they have barracks esophagus or not so i mean you know though like at least those are the things which we can accomplish by endoscopy uh, there are like a multiple treatment options i mean if acid reflux is not that bad and like if it happens occasionally then i would say that mostly in those kind of cases diet and lifestyle modification is enough uh like you know losing some weight you know would like even if they can lose like 10% of the body weight it would help them a lot for the acid reflux symptoms but you know there would be some patients who are on the other spectrum of the disease that you know they would say that even after losing weight even after being compliant with the diet i still have the acid reflux i still cannot sleep so those are the people who would need like you know some kind of treatment i mean the treatment starts from diet and lifestyle modification if that doesn't work then we can go to the medications there are different kind of medications so it start with the antacids so tums and rolades and everything so those are the most simplest form of treatment so whenever we do give that basically the, those are the acid neutralizing agent so that would you know reduce the acidity of the stomach and that would help you now the second thing if it is if those are not working and if the acid reflux is more stronger than that then we can probably go on to something called the h2 blocker so that's the pepsid um it is generally taken twice a day and that reduces the acid production to some extent and then if that doesn't work then the last option like you know medically is like you know giving them like proton pump inhibitors like prilosec or protonix or nexium so basically those are the stronger medication which causes suppression of the acid reflux and which would help them symptomatically the only issue with that is like you know most of the people they have an anatomical defect so you know their uh, their lower esophageal sphincter like you know is weak and because of that they are getting the acid reflux if we give them a medication you know that needs to be given for like a really long term like and proton pump inhibitor they are good medications but you know they have side effects when you know with the chronic use so so that is the thing that if somebody would require probably medication for like 20 30 40 years if it if it is taken for 6 months to a year you know there is not much concerns about the side effect but if you do the acid suppression you know uh, with the proton pump inhibitor for more than a year and you know many of the time we end up seeing that these people are on it for 20 like 10 20 30 years that's when you know you are really suppressing the acid for long time and and acid is there to digest the food so that you can absorb the nutrients so so those are the people they would need some kind of intervention uh you know to make sure that you know their acid reflux is under control and they do not get the side effects of proton pump inhibitors on the long term use you, right so i Well, I was going to say now that we you know you discussed those options can you tell us a little bit about you know the TIF procedure and and how it works Right so you know to better understand the TIF procedure we need to understand the little anatomy of our digestive system so you know we have our esophagus the esophagus you know starts Uh, like you know in the like i would say in the cervical part like means like in the neck then it goes through the chest and then you know uh, below the, like you know right at the end of the chest there is a diaphragm and then you know opening in the diaphragm it uh, it enters the abdominal cavity and that's where it meets the stomach and you know the, we always use to say that there is a lower esophageal sphincter but now with the better understanding of the disease i always consider that there is an external sphincter and internal sphincter so internal sphincter is uh, like you know produced by the lower part of the esophagus there are circular muscles and like you know some sling fibers of the upper part of the stomach so they form the sphincter from inside and the external sphincter is formed by the diaphragm 
uh, so means diaphragm is the respiratory muscle. So, so basically, you know, those two are the ones which forms the pressure gradient at the lower part of the esophagus, so acid does not come up. For whatever is the reason, you know, that mechanism is disturbed, that either the internal sphincter is weak or the external sphincter is weak, and then we have to fix that. Uh, and then, you know, this is like, you know, we need to do the fund application and we need hernia. So basically, TIF is, TIF stands for transoral incision less fund application. So basically, it's done through the mouth that, you know, we put the device which can, you know, take, like which can deploy the fasteners over the scope. We advance it from the mouth, advance it to the stomach. Then we bend the scope so we can look at the, like, you know, fundus of the stomach and we can we can put like a proline fasteners that goes between the lower part of the esophagus and the upper part of the stomach and that would make the so basically that's what we are doing with transoral fund application that we are putting proline fasteners between the lower part of the esophagus and the upper part of the stomach and after a couple of weeks i would say two to three weeks there is a process of serosal fusion uh where like you know the the lower esophageal sphincter becomes nice and tight and because of that the acid reflux goes away thank you for that um explanation and then it looks like we have a lot of questions. So we're going to check in with Wendy. Uh, Wendy, do you have uh, any questions from our audience for Dr. Shaw? We do. And I just, just want to say thanks to everybody tuning in. It looks like we have folks in South Carolina, in New York, down in the Miami area. They're all uh, saying hello to you, Dr. Shaw, and thanks for uh, for speaking with them yeah. this evening. Um, yeah. So I have Carmen asking, does TIF work for all types of reflux, including non-acid reflux? Yes, so it does work for all type of reflux, including non-acid reflux, because what we are doing here is we are reconstructing the the wall. So we are, you know, we are reconstructing the pressure gradient. So that is the reason they reduce anything coming up. So it's not like a proton pump inhibitor, which only reduces the stomach acid. This reduces any kind of reflux. So if after the procedure, if it is successful, uh, then, you know, they can stop taking like the medications completely. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And then I have uh, both Robin and Andy uh, kind of asking if you could speak to the hiatal hernia repair um, as, it, as it relates to TIF. Andrew would like to know if, you know, he could have just TIF instead of TIF and hiatal hernia repair. His doctor says he needs both. He has a three centimeter hiatal hernia. So that's a very good question. Good question. So, you know, if he has a three centimeter hiatal hernia, so that, you know, that was the only reason I explained the anatomy a little bit. So the esophagus enters the abdominal cavity through the hole in the diaphragm, which we call it a diaphragmatic hiatus. If he has a hiatal hernia, that means that, that the diaphragmatic hiatus is big. If there is no hiatal hernia or if the hiatal hernia is less than two centimeter or if it is less than hill grade three means like hill grade one or two, then only straight TIF is enough because in that case, what straight TIF would do is it would fix that small uh, hiatal hernia and it would also, you know, restore the angle of the hip. That's the angle between the esophagus and the upper part of the stomach and that would also do the fund duplication. But if he has a hiatal hernia, which is three centimeter, then it, you know, then then he would need like a hiatal hernia repair and fund duplication both. So yeah, he would definitely if if it's a three centimeter or like anything more than two centimeter or anything more than hill grade two, he would benefit from you know both of the like you know he would benefit from both means hiatal hernia repair followed by fund duplication. And if you see a lot of TIF failures you know, they were like, you know, failures because, you know, the hiatal hernia was not fixed at that time. Very good. We could ask the the reverse too, because we have had questions on previous broadcasts where folks have said, can I just have the hiatal hernia repair? Will that take care of my reflux? Right, right. So if you do the hiatal hernia repair, 
yes, it can take away your reflux, but it is not going to be like 100%. So if you really see how people get the reflux, it's like, you know, you know, generally it starts in the infancy or like, you know, for the women, it starts during the pregnancy that there's a lot of progesterone in the system, which causes like a dilation of all the sphincters. And because of that acid comes up and because the acid coming up, you know, your esophagus is constantly exposed to the acid. When it is constantly exposed to the acid, it causes degeneration of the muscle fiber. And that is the reason, you know, how you get, how, how the reflux starts and the more and more acid comes up, the more and more damage is going to add up. And, you know, that causes hiatal hernia to get worse. So you can fix the hiatal hernia that would improve your reflux to some extent, but it's not going to stop it completely. And if we don't stop it, then we are still leaving that acid to come up all the time, which can cause future damage. And that hiatal hernia is likely going to come back at some point. So, you know, I would say, and then, you know, hiatal hernia repair is a surgery too, right? So like, you know, this is like doing something and just giving you 50 to 60% improvement and leaving something for the later date, you know, which can cause the damage and like potentially undone whatever which was done. So, you know, in my opinion, it could be done, but it is in best interest of patient to get both of them done at the same time in which we are fixing the hiatal hernia and then we are doing fund application, which would prevent any further reflux episode or like, you know, uh, or any future damage. Excellent. Thank you very much. Karen, let's go back to you. All right. Thank you. And, and then Dr. Shaw, since we are talking about um, the hiatal hernia repair and TIF, uh, what is the recovery like? Uh, is it any different from a straight TIF if you get the hiatal hernia repaired? Right. So I would I would say between straight TIF and between hybrid surgery, there is not much difference in recovery. Um, like, you know, for I would say because, you know, we are taking full thickness suture. So we are putting the plastic fasteners, which is full thickness, means they are going from the stomach to outside the stomach, then into the esophagus, and then it comes inside the, come inside the lumen of the esophagus, right? So basically these are the full thickness sutures. You know, people would have some discomfort and it all depends upon, you know, how the pain tolerance is. I have a few says that, you know, it was not much of the discomfort. Some of the people were complaining of pain for like, I would say a day or two, but generally like, you know, it, it should go away within 24 hours. And within three to five days, you know, they would see like, I would say remarkable improvement in their like a pain and everything. So I would say within like for first 24 hours, yes, they would feel some discomfort, but it should get better after that. And and we have noticed that that after the hybrid surgery where surgeon fixes the hiatal hernia and I do the fund application, uh, generally, you know, they will have some pain in, I would say, in the epigastrium and some in the chest and the shoulder because you know whenever they do the hiatal hernia repair you have to put like a good amount of co2 if it is done laparoscopically or robotically and the same thing when i'm doing a fund application from the mouth i have to use a lot of co2 uh, and because of that they get the shoulder pain and the chest pain which generally and the co2 is generally absorbed within 24 hours so that's when they they would feel better so I like you know to answer your question, there is going to be some discomfort, uh, but within 24 hours they would have some improvement, and uh, within three to five days, you know, uh, they should get like you know almost back to normal recovery. And then could you kind of talk about how TIF compares to other anti-reflux surgeries such as right. missing fund application? Yeah. So you know for. So for, for so far, like, you know, the Nissan's fund application was considered the gold standard. Um, and, you know, it's still a great surgery. You know, uh, there's no doubt about it. But basically, if you really see the anatomy, what they are doing is the surgeon has to fix the hiatal hernia first, and they will have to take the dome-shaped portion of the stomach, which we call it a fundus, and we wrap it around the esophagus. 
So versus if we do the TIFF, we are just wrapping around last 2.5 to 3 centimeter of the esophagus to the stomach. So, so, so that is the reason there is a biggest difference between the two surgeries. So whenever you are wrapping around the fundus, uh, around the esophagus, like the entire fundus, the dome-shaped portion of the stomach is gone. And because of that, there are a lot of patients who is complaining of gas bloat syndrome in which they feel like, you know, they want to burp, but they cannot burp. And there are a couple of people who have dysphagia because means trouble swallowing. So if you really see all the studies, like, uh, and, you know, even in the real life, we see that, like after Nissen's fund duplication, dysphagia and gas bloat syndrome is almost up to like, you know, 35 to 40% versus when we do the TIFF, those two things are almost next to nothing. The reason behind that is that we are not wrapping around the entire fundus. We are just taking the last 2.5 to 3 centimeters and wrapping those around, like, you know, the fundus and the, like, and wrapping that around the esophagus. So, so that is the reason, like, you know, uh, those two side effects are not there, but if you see otherwise the symptomatic improvement, it's comparable. Uh, like, you know, the people, the patient symptoms do improve after Nissen and they do improve after straight TIF or the hybrid. So I would say, depending upon which study you are looking at, um, anywhere between like high 70s to early 90% of the patient were off PPI. So, you know, that's true for both of the surgeries. Perfect. And then how can patients um, get diagnosed to see if they're a candidate for TIFF? Right. So, so if they are a candidate for TIFF or not, um, like, you know, they need to see a gastroenterologist. And I would say that specifically if they have acid reflux, they need to see a gastroenterologist who does these kind of treatment because, you know, they would have more idea about like if they would be a candidate or not. Um, and then, you know, there would be a first visit and then I would at least like, you know, then they would need an endoscopy and a Bravo and a manometry. So basically, uh, you know, when they get an endoscopy, uh, uh, the gastroenterologist has to evaluate like, you know, how big is the hiatal hernia uh, or if it is there or not. Uh, we need to see the size in centimeter and we need to see the grade. So that's the width of the hiatal hernia. And that would tell us that if they are a candidate for like straight TIF procedure or not. Um, and then if they do not have Barrett's esophagus or esophagitis, then they would need like a 48 hour pH testing. So in which, you know, uh, after the endoscopy, uh, we put like a Bravo pH capsule. That's uh, the, just this small of a capsule. Right after the procedure, we put it six centimeter above the gastroesophageal junction. And basically that capsule is wirelessly connected to a monitor, uh, which we give it to the patient. And every single time they have acid reflux or every single time they have chest pain regurgitation, they just need to press the button on it. And uh, at the same time, the capsule will be monitoring the amount of acid coming up. And uh, that would, uh, you know, generate a Demeester score and symptomatic association probability. And that would tell us that how bad is the acid reflux. So that is one thing. And the other thing, you know, which we need to know before doing any kind of fund application is that esophagus has like at least okay, manom like okay, like at least some kind of motility because, you know, esophagus has two different kind of muscles, like one kind of muscle, they are longitudinal muscles, they are in the upper part that pushes the food down. And there are, there are other kind of the muscles which makes the lower esophageal sphincter. So we just need to make sure that there are some contractions in the longitudinal muscles. And we can do that either by the end of lip. Uh, if the center has it, it can be done on the same day. If they don't have it, it needs to be done by the manometry in which, you know, a nurse or a doctor will pass like a small probe through the nose. And then, you know, after numbing the nose and then uh, have them swallow water 10 times, uh, which would like, you know, record the contraction. And basically that's what we would need. So, you know, we would need a manometry to show that they have at least some contraction uh, that their esophagus would withstand the surgery. Like, you know, they, they, not withstand, but like, you know, after the TIF and tighten up the lower portion of the esophagus, their esophagus is strong enough to push the food down. Um, and then we also need to make sure that they have acid reflux uh, that we can make sure through 48 hour or 96 hours, like a pH testing or the Bravo. 
Um, and basically that's it. And then we need the endoscopy. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, so, um, you know, once, uh, you know, a person gets diagnosed, they get their TIF procedure. Um, there's a lot of question about the TIF diet. And can mm -hmm. you kind of discuss what the diet's like and, and some of the diet, you know, uh, options that you tell your patients? Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, for first three days, we generally put them on the clear liquid diet. Um, after that, between three days and 14 days, we kind of start them on like, you know, full liquid diet in which they can add more and more. After 14 days, we can start like, you know, like a small quantities, but like, you know, just a little bit of solids. And like, you know, at week four, we probably advance it more. And at week six, you know, we take away all the restrictions. So basically three days of clear liquid, two weeks of full liquids. And uh, after that, that, like, you know, uh, like a diet that like, you know, we gradually increase and coming back to normal diet at week six. Six. So uh, do a lot of your patients lose while they're yeah, I mean, yeah, good amount of the people, like you know, they, you know, they do do lose some weight because of that too. Yes. Well, um, let's check in with Wendy. I think we have a ton of questions coming in for you, Dr. Shaw. Wendy. We do. Thanks. So I'm going to start with Mark, uh, who asks just regarding diagnostics. Uh, what is the minimum Demeester score that warrants a TIF? Right. So again, you know, it all depends upon, you know, how much is the acid coming up? Like, you know, if you see the 95th percentile, it's like 14.7. That's the Demeester score. So, you know, it, it, it means that if you have Demeester score up to 14.7, then that would still fall between 95th percentile of like, you know, the confidence interval. So if it is more than that, then you definitely know that, you know, you have the acid reflux. But, you know, if somebody has symptoms and there are a lot of people who have something called uh, transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation and that is you know the reason for that acid reflux if that relaxation is just for a second many of the time it is not picked up and in in those kind of situation you know you might have like a little bit of like you know the demeester score on the normal side or the higher side but if you see the line tracing it will show that you have like you know multiple acid reflux so you know it, it so demeester score is not not the only indicator you only uh, you also need to look at like you know the symptomatic association probability or uh, symptomatic index that would tell us that you know when they say that they are having like a chest pain or they are having regurgitation is it related to the acid reflux or not and like sometimes it is better to do the Demeester score like you know I mean the 20 like you know the pH testing for five days and, you know, depending upon like that, like for how many days they had acid reflux, for how many days the Demeester score was elevated, you know, I would say that out of five days, if they would have acid reflux means elevated Demeester score for more than two days, then, and then, you know, if, if PPI is not helping or like, you know, they are on PPI and they don't want to take it because of the side effects, then it's reasonable to do some kind of anti-reflux treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also have Lynn saying, hi, Dr. Shaw, and thanks for providing this great information. Is the TIF procedure covered by most insurance? Right. I mean, you know, mostly it is covered by the insurances, like, you know, and if it is not covered, then, you know, we do the prior authorization. So, I mean, we, to be honest, in my practice, we did not have much, uh, like, you know, um, we, we didn't have many insurances like which I can think of the top of my head that did not cover the procedure. Okay, thank you. Have a couple of questions regarding LPR from Tyler and Lori, just about mm -hmm. how um, if, if LPR is a factor in determining whether or not a patient has TIF, if it can help treat it. And then if you have TIF, can your symptoms worsen after the TIF when you have LPR? Right. So I can tell you one thing, if you have LPR, that's called laryngopharyngeal reflux, the symptoms are not going to get worse after TIF for sure. 
um like you know so a lot of people have lpr when the acid comes up all the way to the back of the throat and causes irritation and you know because in the tiff or the hybrid in that we are doing we are fixing the hiatal hernia and we are doing a fund application so there is no way the lpr symptoms are going to get worse it's definitely going to improve right thank you um, quick question from Michelle. Um, what does it mean when you can't vomit after an endoscopy? Yet I used to be able to. I have a hiatal hernia. Cannot vomit after the endoscopy or cannot vomit after the surgery? Maybe she means the surgery. Right. I mean, yeah, I have like, there is nothing like, you know, because endoscopy is just we are taking a look with the scope, right? So, um, I don't think there is anything which would cause you not to vomit after the endoscopy, but if it is after, like, you know, the surgery, like a Nissan's fund application, uh, like I initially explained that, you know, when they are taking the fundus of the stomach and wrapping it around the esophagus, and because of that, the dome shape portion is gone, that's the reason a lot of people you know, feel like they want to burp or they want to vomit, but they cannot warm, they cannot vomit. And this is called the gas bloat syndrome. And that typically happens after like, you know, um, like a Nissan's fund application, known adverse event of it. And how does that correlate or, or compare to symptoms that, that post-operative experiences after a, a TIF procedure? Right. With TIF, you know, we have never seen anyone complaining of gas bloat syndrome. Uh, because, you know, we are not wrapping around the entire fundus. We are just wrapping around the last two centimeter to three centimeter of the esophagus uh, to the stomach. So after TIF, you know, I never had anyone complaining of like, you know, gas bloat syndrome. Okay. So, that, so that's a major advantage, yeah. Very good. And then last but not least, before I turn it back over to, to you and Karen is, what is the expected durability of TIF? Right. So oh, there are right, right, right. So you know there are multiple trials done. I mean, you know, uh, the the last one. I mean, you know, I can think of off the top of my head is the Tempo trial, um, and then you know there are a couple of trials in which, the, like you know, I think in Tempo it followed the patient for five years, versus there are a couple of trials in which they followed it for longer time too. So it does show that, you know, the, once the patients are off PPI, it does last for five to 10 years. I mean, you know, we don't have like a data beyond 10 years that I could remember off the top of my head, but I think we might have, but like, you know, off the top of my head, I remember the data at the 10 year also looks at the good amount of people are off PPI, uh, like even at the 10 years and five years. And it's the same with the Nissan's fund application too that you know eventually like some of them would start having the reflux after like a 10 years but again if that happens it's easy to fix uh, like yeah so it's not a bigger problem okay and then one more sorry uh just one that came in yeah. from donna i have a six centimeter hiatal hernia and infiltrates mm -hmm. are showing in the lower left lobe on ct scan probably from aspirating i am 73 years old how dangerous is it to let this go my doctors haven't seemed too worried Right. So, you know, what she's really describing, like a six centimeter height of her knee is considered like, you know, a really big in size. And, you know, possibly because of that, she has a lot of acid reflux. And because of that, when she said that she had infiltrates on the left lower lung, that means that she had an aspiration pneumonia. And uh, I mean, you know, I have seen many times in my practice that if left untreated, like the patients do have like aspiration pneumonia multiple times again and again. And again, you know, that's not good for the patient, right? I mean, eventually it can cause the scarring and it can cause the long-term problem too. So, I would say that, you know, she should get at least some kind of anti-reflux procedure done. And, uh, you know, she would definitely not be a candidate for straight TIF, but, you know, she can go and see a gastroenterologist and a surgeon, and uh, she would benefit either from a Nissan's fund application or like a hiatal hernia repair followed by like, you know, the TIF, the hybrid, like, you know, the C-TIF. Yeah, but, and, and, you know, in, and in my, like, and the other question she asked was, like, how safe it is, right? Yes. Yeah. So for the TIF, I mean, if you see, like, 
you know, there are more than 25,000 procedures have been done all over the world so far, and the risk of any serious adverse event is less than 0.25%. So whenever the serious adverse event rate is less than 0.5%, that's considered pretty safe. And a lot of these side effects were with the earlier version when it started many years ago. I mean, since then, you know, the device has been modified multiple times and, you know, now it is much more easier to do it. So lately, you know, I'm not aware about like many bad outcomes. So, you know, as the time evolves, the surgery is getting better and better. Uh, there, you know, yeah. And I mean, the serious adverse event of 0 0.25, 0 0.250 percent or less, it's considered very acceptable. Thank you. Karen, back to you. All right, wonderful. Good conversation. We do have, um, looks like one final question that came in and uh, the question's from Robin. Are a lot of these problems genetic? So is GERD genetic? A genetic problem, um, I guess. Right, I mean, I don't think it's a genetic problem, but like, you know, it could be an anatomical problem. You might have genes which would produce certain kind of anatomy and that might cause like, you know, your diaphragmatic hiatus to be a little loose. So that's what I could think of. But otherwise, there is no, like, you know, like current research, I don't think there is anything which shows that if you have this gene, you are likely to have acid reflux. I mean, you know, a lot of people would say that, that their family had GERD, but that's probably because of their built and their anatomy. I mean, so, you know, yeah, so I think that's what it is, right? Well, thank you for that. Um, we've had a really, really good conversation today and lots of really good questions. Uh, Dr. Shaw, do you have any words or for them for living GERD free? Uh, can you repeat your question? Sorry. Yeah. So, do you have any last words for our viewers and any tips uh, success for them for living GERD free? Right. Well, I mean, I would say that. It if anybody has a reflux for a long time, it definitely should be evaluated. Uh, PPI are safe if that can be taken for a short term. But, you know, if, if there are some people who have been on PPI for many years, like, you know, that's when, you know, they need to consider like some kind of intervention. You know, th there are not much side effects with, uh, with H to blockers like Pepsid. So if somebody doesn't have that bad of a reflux, you know, they can manage with diet, lifestyle modification, thumbs, uh, Pepsid, you know, th those are the things which is considered acceptable. But even that, if they have developed like osteoporosis because they were on PPI for too long, uh, they have developed kidney problems, interstitial nephritis, you know, that's when they really need to worry about and think about the long-term side effects of PPI and see what options are available. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. And again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you're in the Sarasota, uh, Florida area, that's where Dr. Shaw is located. Um, if you're located outside of Florida, please visit our physician locator at, at girdhelp.com and you can find a TIF trained physician in your area. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, bye.